Welcome to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Listen and grow as Dell questions the status quo, encourages you to think differently, and empowers you to make a better life. Get ready as Dell challenges core beliefs, seeks the truth, and reveals the roadmap to the lifestyle you really want. And now your host, multi-millionaire, national award-winning investor, CEO and founder of Lifestyles Unlimited, Del Wamsley. Welcome to the Del Wamsley Radio Show, where the hype ends and the help begins. I'm your host, Del Wamsley, and as always, we're working on your financial freedom. With me here today on Tell Dell Tuesday is Garab Goyle out of uh, Dallas, Texas. Actually, it's a co- copal, but... I guess most people know that as part of Dallas, and um, we're happy to have him here with us today. So, Gaurav, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Dale. Happy to be here. So tell us um, tell us about your background, what you did before you got into real estate, and how you found yourself getting involved with what we do. Well, Dell, I found, uh, well, I started my career as a management consultant, um, and I did that for about 17 years. But while I was doing that, I was investing in stock market. And a lot of us, that's how we were taught is to grow money via investing in stock market and 401k. And it came to a point where I just wasn't doing very well. I was making, I felt like I was making the bad decisions or, or just uh, not good at stock picking. So I was looking for a change. And one of my colleagues uh, at my work was a lifestyles member, is a lifestyle member. And he introduced me to lifestyles, which was a brand new area. I knew nothing about real estate. I knew nothing about lifestyle. And, uh, you know, I came in for a case study that led me to a two-day, and I became a member back in 2016. So that completely changed my life in terms of how I want to invest my life savings. So why were you searching for something else? Simply because you weren't doing very well or, or not as well as you thought you should in the stock market? Yeah, and, you know, I worked in IT, and my wife works in IT right now, and I knew that I had a certain number of years before that might could be a potential challenge. Um, and the second was I, I, I didn't expect, I didn't see myself working in the area that I was working for the next 30 years and not having a different lifestyle. I was in consulting that required travel. I wanted to not do as much travel. Um, and I wanted to have some flexibility where I could call my own shots. So knowing that uh, I didn't want to work in this area so well, and then just investing in stock market and going through changes that happen, you know, if something somebody sneezes, the stock market goes down. If somebody coughs, the stock market goes up. It just was not <laughs> something I wanted to be in. I needed something that was more stable, more grounded, and not be influenced by vagaries of the world or the nation. So. Uh, I I felt like I had to find something different. Did you take a step um, out of having a corporate job to being a consultant as a midway step? Uh, well, I I had a corporate job as a management consultant. So I was working for a consulting firm, so I wasn't um, I wasn't an independent consultant, but I was working for a big four consulting firm, and my job was to work with clients that were that were hiring the firm that I was part of. To do a job, uh, so that cause that that was really what I. But I still was an employee of a company. I see. So when you first started this, your uh, your goal was to start out as a passive, I guess. Yes. So when I started this back in 2016, um, I went to the two day uh, course, which really opened my eyes about multifamily and real estate, and I felt like what fit the different options that I was given, which was single family passive or be a lead was be a passive. You know, we had smaller kids. Both of us worked in corporate, still putting in a lot of hours. And I felt like passive was the way that I could invest my um, my savings in uh, without uh, giving up a lot of time that I didn't have much of anything. So uh, you did that from 2016 to 2018. How many passive deals did you get into? Well, between 2016 and 2018, I got into probably around seven deals um, at, in those two years. Um, and uh, that actually was real eye-opening. I just felt like I, I found something that I could understand. I found something that I could see the picture of how that was going to make me money. 
And so when did you decide that you were going to go ahead and be a lead yourself then? So um, basically, as I started to invest as passive, I started to learn a lot about uh, what, how multifamily works. You know, you go to case studies, you go to see properties, you talk to other people who are actually running the deals, you get to learn how it's done. So that gave me some confidence and knowledge about uh, what the work is of a lead, and I felt that's what I want to do as my next step. So uh, as I started to learn more about how uh, uh, acquiring and managing a property works, I got more and more interested. So uh, towards the latter part of 2017, um, Lifestyles came up with a program for certified leads. I felt that gave me a lot of knowledge and education, hours and hours of knowledge and education to uh, learn how to be a lead. So based on those two factors, I felt comfortable that I wanted to do this and I could do this. So let's roll back now a second because I'm going to take you back to the two-day when you when you came to the two-day. As a management consultant, and quite honestly, I don't know exactly what a management consultant does, but you, um, knowing you do know what you did. So as a management consultant, what in the two-day caught your attention and said, aha, that's, that's interesting, that's, that's life-changing, that makes a difference? Um, I mean, you're in there helping other people run their businesses, or I guess is what a management consultant does. Uh, yet this is something that you, a light bulb goes on and you say, hey, wow, there's a step that I hadn't seen before. What did you see? Um, I, 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 when I attended the two day, the one major thing that resonated with me was numbers because I'm an engineer background, uh, and I, I like how I could understand how the numbers worked and, uh, they worked that would help me understand exactly how it worked. And then the second part is it was a new world. So I didn't know how anybody could be an investor and make money and, it was explained to me in real clear terms how one could actually make money and how money is being made and how we can make money. So the path was laid out to me and the fact that it worked was laid out to me. So for me, just having those two things, um, I felt like very confident that I could do this, that I could take my investment and grow as part of, uh, you know, in real estate, either single family, multifamily, or passive. Let's talk about getting ready for your first deal. You went through the training classes. You already told, shared that with us. Um, so, other than going through the training classes on how to be a lead, what else did you do? What were the steps you had to take to get prepared to be a lead investor? Well, it was a lot of uh, talking to other people who are leads to understand how they found the uh, lead responsibility to be and make sure I'm ready for it and also learn from what they think makes a good lead. I talk to what we have in Lifestyles mentors and operation consultants to understand from their experience what it took to be a lead and the time commitment that I would have to take or, or my wife and I had to make to be a lead so that we spend the time in the business. So after we went through that um education as well as conversations and understanding and we we uh, all came up with a plan that said we can do this and we would enjoy doing it that's when i took the first step of being a lead and when you did that what were your steps in order um i'll give you a couple of options out that i'm thinking of was it raising the capital first looking for the deal first setting up your uh, legal entity first? What, what things did you do in what order? This is, by the way, I know what you should do, but I'm asking for the audience out there. Well, first you have to build your network. Um, so one network is your investor network. So you need to have a set of investors who may invest with you. So you've got to go out there and tell that you're looking for a deal. Then you have to also build your team, the team of lawyers, consultants, brokers, mentors who will help you through the process, who know who've done this before. And then you go talk to brokers and other people and start looking for a deal. That's what my process was. So you prepare a lot so that you're ready when an opportunity comes to take advantage of it. 
Now, you had already gone through 22 deals as a passive. You'd KP'd on some of them, so you had your fingers in a lot of different kinds of deals. When you started looking for yourself, what kind of a deal were you looking for? What was your ideal package or as close to as you could get? I wanted something that is about 30 to 60 units, and I had a price point of uh, up to $4 million in the Dallas-Fort Worth network, uh, the, the Metroplex. So I, I wanted to be near where I live, and I wanted to be a size where I could manage and um, I could um, learn from that experience. And how did you work that out? What did this first deal look like? So my first deal it was a 58-unit deal in a Dallas-Fort Worth suburb called Ulysses. And it's a workforce housing, what we call the class C's in the multifamily. And uh, it was a underperforming deal in a very good market in a great location. Um, so that was what we liked about the deal, where we could uh, do some rehab on it. Uh, there was a lot of deferred maintenance. So we could do rehab. We could improve the property, uh, hence increasing rents and eventually increasing the value of the property. So this was a value play? It was a hybrid. It was a highly occupied property, but with a lot lower rents. Um, so we didn't have to do a lot of value on it, but there was plenty of hybrid uh, value and um, yield on the property. So as you got into this one, how did it move? Did it move smoothly through the process as you had planned it? Do you have any hiccups? Uh, did you learn anything? Oh, I learned a lot. And, uh, you know, when you take on a, a responsibility such as this, it is not an easy responsibility. There's a lot of sleepless nights based on what we saw. We learned a lot. Um, um, so we, we faced multiple things. We had a situation where our fire panel went out and we had to replace it and we didn't have uh, a component available for several days, causing us to be on the fire watch list. So it's a more technical term, but basically what it means is, you know, the fire department is going to force you to make sure that the property is being watched by someone in case there's a problem. So those are examples where we lost sleep. We learned a lot about hey, these things can happen, make sure they're serviced well in advance. Um, we learned things uh, such as replacing a boiler, that boilers can go out at any second, especially when it's winter, and then they're not available and residents uh, get impacted by that. So there's a lot of learnings such as this that we had. We also went through COVID with this property. That was another learning when we went through all the challenges a lot of us multifamily owners did during COVID. So that was also a great learning for us. So it's been a very good property overall, but we have learned a lot and we've lost a lot of sleep <laughs> with some of the challenges that we've had to have. But having said that, it has been all worth it. When you ran into the challenges, who did you run to for help? Oh, it's the Lifestyles Unlimited Network. So you go to mentors, but you also go to fellow leads. There's so much knowledge about so many different situations that everyone has faced already or is facing that you can depend on someone to say, oh, yeah, I know that person has faced that before. Why don't you talk, that? talk to that person? So that, to me, was an amazing help for someone who's starting out. Okay. So um, is this one of the properties you've sold so far? No, this is the one I still own. Okay. Let's talk about returns to your investors so far. What, what have you been able to do with it? So, so far, we've done cash on cash return um, uh, on this property about uh, 12% so far. Now, it is a little bit lower than where we want it to be um, because we are prepping the property for sale this year. So, we are reinvesting the funds back into the property to make it attractive to buyers. All right, let's so, stop right there. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with Rob Goyle and the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. you 
roadmap to creating the lifestyle you really want. Keep listening. The Del Wamsley Radio Show returns in moments. Lifestyles Unlimited members share their stories and strategies for success at case study events. If you got laid off tomorrow, what would you do? Would you have to be working at McDonald's or wait to try and find another job with the downsizing the economy? Kept on coming to meetings, even with David Fisher online and stuff like that, but still we just like, we need to make the jump. So we kept praying for time to get this job done to, to be able to find the properties how do we find the properties how do you find the time and god answered our prayers and he got downsized from his corporate job but they didn't buy just one house right no they did not you rehab in house number nine right now nine wow so every month the cash flow is thirty two hundred dollars Okay, the equity of all the houses is up to 280000 Join us this month and learn from people just like you. Check in person and online dates at lucasestudy.com. That's lucasestudy.com. You're hearing the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Want more life-changing knowledge? Access our podcast and listen on demand at lifestylesunlimited.com under the radio tab. Now your host, Dell Wamsley. Welcome back to Dell Wamsley Radio Show. With me here today on Tell Dell Tuesday is Gaurav Goyle out of uh, Dallas, Texas. And Gaurav was explaining to us uh, about how he was taking his first property now that he bought way back in 2018 and is prepping it for a sale, which is an interesting concept. So, Gaurav, why don't you pick that point up and tell us what you're trying to do and what the process is. So, Dell, it's a unique situation I find on this property because uh, this property was under rent control for our first three and a half years of ownership, and it came out of rent control uh, in the first quarter of 2022. So our rents have gone up between 40 and 50% on the units when we turned this property to market. In order for it to be a market rent property, we had to do certain improvements to compete with market-like properties. So what we are doing is taking the um, free cash flow that the property is generating and reinvesting in improving the property so that the next investor or the buyer of this property can see the value that they can generate by leaving the units at market rents, which are significantly higher. So that is our current plan that we are going through on this property. What types of things do you have to change on that garage to make it market uh, acceptable? Some things we don't have to change. I mean, there's a pool, there's amenities, uh, you know, the the paint is good. We had to make the breezeways more better. They were a little bit older, so we wanted to make sure that people, when they entered, the curb appeal was better. Uh, we are improving the interiors of the units um, to have forward flooring, black appliances, upgraded fixtures, um, and uh, we're just uh, increasing some of the curb appeal from painting some of the brick that the, that the paint has faded. Um, putting some money into marketing um, so that we can market the property to the right audience. So we've been putting some money into it, and so far uh, we've seen a good response. Now, on a side note, just for my own education here, uh, you say your breezeways. Are your breezeways like hallways, exterior or interior hallways that are open air? Yes, they're interior hallways. Uh, the interior breezeways that connect the units, they're basically the walkways between the units. Um, and, uh, you know, they had doors where you have difficulty sometimes putting furniture through, right? So we had to remove the doors. Uh, we had to remove some of the old um, covers on up above the doors so people can, the rain doesn't go inside the breezeways. So we had to make some improvements. The lighting was a little bit dim because in the interior, so the lighting can be important to make sure people feel comfortable. So we had to improve that, make it a little bit more modern, change the flooring, you know, so that it, it looks bright and clean. So we did a lot of those improvements, or so actually we're in the process of doing most of them. What year built was this property? This is a 1968 built property. All right, so um, you've got this process down. Let's talk now about what you think you're going to be able to make a gain. If you, I'm assuming you're, you're intending to sell it, so there's got to be some strike point you're looking for as far as the sales price. And what kind of profit will that end up 
paying uh, your partners in this deal? So we are uh, planning a, um, a return of about 100 to 150 percent, depending on the price we can get over the four co- four years of hold we've had. Um, so that would be over, you know, between 25 and 30 percent uh, average yearly return. Now, is there any cash flow on top of that that you've paid out, or because I said recently you're you're holding the cash flow to do the upgrades? What about before that? Yeah, we did about 12 percent return uh, cash on cash prior to the time we started holding the cash. All right, so the the 25 plus 12 brings you into a very good number. Then, um, looking here on your resume, I see that you also started selling off some of the past, and not you, but your deals that you were in started to sell off. Tell us about some of those as you got out of those deals. Yeah, those were the easiest way to make money, obviously, because I didn't do any of the work. Uh, somebody else did the work, and I just cashed the check. So when I started as passive, that was the biggest uh, kind of an eye-opener for me, how these numbers would work. Uh, I started investing in 2016. I've invested every year in at least two to four deals, and they have given me a return from 60% to 115 percent, and I mean, if 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 I can get 60 percent on a couple of years or three years of hold, I'm happy. But uh, you know, I've I've had some deals that have gone over 100 percent, and that has been uh, very good financially and from a wealth building perspective. So you start hitting these numbers. You know, rule one is don't lose money. Rule two, there's got to be cash flow to live off of. Rule three, you can't get rich slow. So you need those big capital gains pops to infuse more capital into your your buckets so you can continue to invest. How did you know you were ready to retire by t- 2021? Had you added more cash flow properties? Did you take had you increased the number of deals you were a lead in or was it because these other deals started to sell and you saw you're going to have cash to work with? I think it's the last one. I started to see these deals and I could see that I already put in, you know, I, I call it, I, I, I sowed some seeds, right? And they're starting to now bear fruit. So even though I had a few deals sell, I could see that since I had invested over the last three, four years, the other deals would eventually sell. And I could see that the, the cash flow, it's not cash flow necessarily, but those returns coming through. And the cash flow was good, but, I, but that was not what I was looking for in the deals. I was looking for more of the returns at the time of sale. Uh, And I could see that if if a couple of deals sell every year, that would be enough for me to continue to live off it. Um, Now, I've got to ask you this. This is kind of the little sickness inside of me. Laugh, laugh, (laughs) laugh out loud. But uh, I always like to ask this. What did the people at your job think when you told them you were going to quit your job and retire? What did did they think about that? A little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs or what? Kind of. I think, um, well... You know, it was it was interesting. Um, initially, they did not believe it that that's what I was doing. Uh, they didn't understand what I was doing. Um, they felt that there was some other thing I was trying to do, but I wasn't revealing. Like who would retire <laughs> at point three, right? Uh, that's that, funny. Hey, maybe that, he's going that funny, doesn't want to tell us where he's going. So it was a lot of people who just didn't believe it. Um, um, but you know, if, if, if you know, if, if, since they've been for the people who've been in touch with me since then, they know that that's the life I'm living. I have truly retired and focusing on being a lead investor. Boy, that's funny. That you talk about the uh, zero sum gain mentality in life. That hey, for me to have a dollar, somebody else has to lose one. Mentality. <laughs> if you're going, I know there's something secret you're doing, man. You're not telling me. It's a secret. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, you know, because everything about lifestyles is not that. Everything is the abundance mentality. There's enough for all of us, right? Yeah. And now we're on to really the rest of the story, as I like to say. So, Grav, what is it that you see your future looking like at this from this point forward? It's a very important question and an interesting question. I think one thing... You know, everything up to this point was financial freedom. But once I've reached the financial freedom, what do you do with your time, right? What is your, what do you want your life to be is very interesting thing to think about. So I've, I've thought about it, and right now my focus is three things I brought it down to. One is, um, you know, I want to spend more time with the family, which I've started to do, you know, whether it's here or in India. The second is I want to find ways to be part of the community. I, I start, I, I, I'm part of a nonprofit 
um, since November 2021, and I've enjoyed being part of it. So I want to continue doing that and spend more time doing that. And then the third is being a good, effective lead and give back. So, you know, people helped me get where I wanted to be. I didn't do it myself. I want to be of help to other people. So uh, uh, that that's really right now what I'm focused on is achieving those three things. How old are you kids? I have a twin, 12-year-old boy and girl. And have they sparked any interest in what you're doing yet, or are they still too young? Well, I have I have them I, I have given them the taste. I actually asked them to invest some of their pocket money into my deals. They invest in every deal, and they reinvest. And sometimes they take some money out to buy something nice for them. So they certainly I've certainly tried to get them involved, and they have shown interest in being involved, especially since. They're selling deals, and I'm telling them about how much money they're going to make. That certainly has sparked some interest. <laughs> uh, so you're educating from the greed end down. I like that. <laughs> Probably the best way to go at a young age. Uh, what's in it for me, Dad? I like that. All right, so um, we've got the kids growing up here. We've got the future uh, looking really good. I like the idea of you giving back. Um, I'm going to hold you to that. You know, you you realize this is recorded, and someday <laughs> you're going to get this phone call from me or one of the other guys going, "Hey, uh, you remember this recording? I want to give back." Blew up, the, and uh, you'll get that call, and uh, somebody will want you to help us do something with somebody, help some people. But other than that, let's talk about this thing, this charity that you're. You do. How'd you get involved in that, and how is that so fulfilling? So this. This uh, nonprofit, or uh, it's a nonprofit public-private uh, partner partnership. It, it it it's located next to a property I bought in 2021, and I just stumbled upon it. Uh, they were trying to improve the area through um, providing um, you know food, healthcare, uh, after-school programs, uh, you know summer school. They were trying to do things for the community, and I just thought it was interesting. So they didn't have an ownership. Uh, in, uh, any owner from multifamily interested in joining. And they said, hey, if you're interested, you can join. So I kind of just stumbled accidentally upon it. And it has, had, had part, I've been part of it about eight, nine months now, and it's been very fulfilling. I feel like I'm part of a solution. I have a voice in giving some ideas about how to improve the community, community where the residents that in the property that we own live. So it has been more... Um, it, it, it has given me a different avenue to make an impact. I was going to say, how does that make you feel? But I don't think feels the right word for it. What, what full, how does it fulfill you? That's, that's the question I'm looking for. Um, it, it just hum, humbles you a little bit. You know, it kind of gives you an opportunity to see people who don't have the same opportunities as you, how are they living, and make a difference in their life. Um, something that sometimes in, in a job, a corporate job, you don't come across those situations, right? You drive around those neighborhoods or whatever. Now that you see it, it humbles you to see how, what different areas people, we can help people have a better life. Um, and to be part of the solution is fulfilling to me as in I made a difference, like I'm doing something good with my time. Um, so that that's how I feel or I, it, it helps me um, uh, when I participate in those activities. How many uh, total lead deals have you done where you were the lead investor? We've done four. We've sold one, and we are buying our fifth. We're in the process of purchasing our fifth. What do you see do you, in your mind, and this is we've only got a minute for this, but in a really quick one-minute statement, how do you rationalize that going on for the rest of your life? Have you thought that one through yet? Do you have that plan, how it all kind of just keeps working together forever? It's a good question. I don't know the answer. I didn't think I would buy the fifth deal so soon, but it's like an itch that you find a good <laughs> deal, the numbers work, you've got to go at it. It's like it's growing yourself. It's going for the next thing. It's having a challenge. I hope at some point that will probably become less important. I'll find other things more important, but right now, that I still have that itch that I have to scratch where I have to find the next thing that will take me to the next level. Um, um, and that's what I'm doing right now. I'm buying my fifth deal. <laughs> <laughs> has the, has the deals changed any, are you, have you changed what you're chasing? Oh, so we always went with agency loan debt. So that was good. Like we'd, we'd made that decision. We've always done that. Even 
last year. And this year also, we what we found. So one thing we found is the the the, um, the leverage is lower, and our projection of increased in in uh, rents have gone lower because of the economy that we are looking forward. So we become more conservative in how we underwrite, how much we can raise rent. I certainly have taken that to heart, and you know, under promise, over deliver. You know, best product, best price. Things that we we've, we've learned in lifestyles. That's really what I believe in. So I'd rather be more conservative. So. Looking forward, things look a little bit hazy, and I'm just trying to be more conservative in my underwriting. All right, my friend. Thank you for being on today and sharing your story with us. The rest of you out there, remember this. Garab, Del Wamsley, and all the rest of us. We don't do it for the money. We do it for the lifestyle. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you tomorrow. The information and opinions you hear on the Del Wamsley Radio Show are those of the host, Del Wamsley, his guests, and his callers. The Del Wamsley Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Del Wamsley Show constitutes an endorsement, recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.